today. We are continuing on in a series of messages based on the first seven chapters of the book of Acts. Acts uh, 1 through 7, we're looking at those chapters as we, as we delve into it and explore the book of Acts. Can I tell you this morning, can I admit something this morning? And that is that I am thrilled to be preaching through the book of Acts. I know it's hard to tell when I get excited. <laughs> I know it's hard to tell, you know, when I get, when I get pumped up about something, right? right? Yeah, yeah. But I am pumped up about rediscovering so many of the principles that I have long forgotten sometimes, that I have overlooked sometimes, that I have maybe even not realized sometimes. But the book of Acts seems to open all that up for us, begins to reveal to us everything that we need to see and to understand so that we can be everything that the, that the good Lord has called us to be. So that we can become what the good Lord has called the church to be in, in our time, in our place, in Freeport, Illinois in 2022. So let's look. We're going to be looking at uh, Acts, the third chapter. Beginning at verse number one, we're going to be looking at probably one of the first signs and wonders that Jesus performed through his disciples uh, here in, in the book of Acts. One of the most powerful, one of the most powerful miraculous things that happened and one of the most joy-filled events that took place uh, in the early chapters of the book of Acts. Read with me if you will. Acts 3 beginning at verse number one, it reads like this. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man named, man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Who seeing Peter and John about to give into the temp, go into the temple, ask for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I want to speak for just a few minutes this morning simply from this thought this morning. Reflecting the restorer. Reflecting the restorer. Lord Jesus, we're thankful, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We're thankful that we serve a God that is immutable. That means you change not, Lord God. We're thankful, Lord God, that your power and your strength and your anointing is even today available for us, Lord Jesus. We're thankful, Lord God, that you've chosen to use weak vessels like us, Lord God, in your work and in your purposes and in your plans. We pray that you'll anoint this word, that it may settle deep within our heart and our soul, that we might, Lord Jesus, embrace what you have called for us. In Jesus' glorious and wonderful name we, we pray. Amen and amen. As I begin to look at this text, as I begin to look at what is considered to be one of the first signs of healing in the book of Acts, one of the first signs and wonders performed through the disciples as they had been filled with the Holy Spirit, I begin to realize that there is one powerful lesson that the early church understood that it is direly important that we understand as well. It's a principle about the Word of God as it contains the signs and wonders. You see, the early church believed something that we desperately need to get back to and that is that they believe that the word of God ran in tandem with signs and wonders. In other words the word of God seemed to show up whenever those signs showed up. Whenever the word was signs were there again and again. You see it's a principle that we see in the very last verse in Mark. Uh, Mark's gospel. Mark 16 and 20. Notice what, it, what he said about this. He said and they went out and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. The early church truly believed that, that the word of God was oftentimes present when the signs were present. That the, when, when there was a miracle 
miracle, you could look not very far and find the Word of God. Sometimes the Word of God came first, and then signs and wonders followed it. Other times, as we'll see throughout the book of Acts, that in the middle of a message, in the middle of a sermon, signs and wonders would take place. Then, as in our case today, we'll see that a miracle will take place, and the Word of God will immediately be preached again and again. It seems to be a pattern that shows up time and time throughout the entirety of the book of Acts. Now let me tell you something. This is a principle. This is not a rule. Why? Because we serve a sovereign God that works the way he wants to work, that does what he wants to do. He doesn't require, he is not a vending machine. Can you say amen? He's not a vending machine that if we mash all the proper buttons that we can get what we want. When we come to him, he is a sovereign God that moves the way he desires to move. But here in the word of God, these, uh, the early church understood something. They understood that the word of God ran in tandem with signs and wonders. Now that, that did something to the heart of the early church that we need to realize. That gave them a profound confidence in the Word of God. They understood to expect a few things when they began to preach the Word of God. They understood that as they, they declared the very words of God, the kingdom of God would become manifest. That as they declared the very Word of God, the Holy Spirit would be there. As they declared the very Word of God, that Jesus would show up. As they declared the very Word of God, power would begin to be manifested in their hearts and their lives. They understood that, that to expect two things. First of all, they understood to expect that, it, that in the moving of the, the Word of God, in the preaching of the Word of God, that people would respond. Some of them would respond positively because they would respond and give their lives to Jesus Christ. Others would respond negatively, sometimes violently against them. So they understood that when they preached the Word of God, anything could happen. When they preached the Word of God, anybody could respond in any other way. But they also come to realize that when they preached the Word of God, heaven responded. When they preached the Word of God, the kingdom of God responded. When they preached the Word of God, these things begin to be manifest in their life. Why are we not seeing them today? Maybe we don't have the confidence in the Word that, we, that they had. Maybe we don't rely on that, that principle. Maybe when we present the truth of God, we don't present it in that manner or that way. But let me tell you, I believe that God's Word will be confirmed in our lives again and again as we declare what Jesus had to say. Now as we understand that, we understand that oftentimes signs and wonders are confirmed by the Word of God and the Word of God is confirmed by these signs and wonders. Well, there's one principle that we need to realize and that is that where there is miracles, where there is signs and wonders, there is also a message. In other words, there's a, there's a meaning behind what takes place. There is a meaning behind oh, what is the manifestation is. There is a meaning behind the miracles. I believe there's a meaning behind every miracle in the, in the life of Jesus Christ. And I believe there's a miracle, a meaning and a message behind every miracle that took place in the book of Acts. And so as we begin to look at this, we need to look to see exactly what word was being confirmed by this sign? What word was being, was being signed, sealed, and delivered from the kingdom of God by way of a sign and a wonder? And we see that as we look into the message of Simon Peter immediately following this event. We're going we're gonna to spend a lot of time on that next week. And by a lot of time, I don't mean a long sermon. Okay, just get me right. Let me just get. We're going to spend some time in the next, next week on, on Simon Peter's response to this miracle. But in the middle of that miracle, Simon Peter says something he hasn't said before. He says something that, that, that's part of the gospel that he hasn't revealed before. Something that is telling to what I believe the underlying foundational principle of this miracle really is. Notice what he says in verse number 21. St speaking concerning Jesus Christ, Simon Peter declares this, whom heaven must receive unto the time of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. What was he saying? What was Peter saying here? Peter saying from the time of old, part of God's plan has always been the restoration of all things. He wanted them to know that the mission of Jesus Christ was not merely to come to do his thing and to go away, but to that all things would be restored. How many things? 
all things would be restored. And he, and, he, and he pointed to a time that is coming when we're going to, as believers, we're going to sit back and we're going to see a world that once rejected God, now it's made pure, now it's made whole, now it's been restored, now it's back to where it's, it was meant to be. That part of the ministry of Jesus Christ, time and time again through every miracle that he, that he performed, was a miracle of restoration in their life. And I believe that the underlying meaning of healing in the first place is that of restoration. Jesus believed that people had, who had eyes they couldn't see need to be healed because eyes were made to see. Ears was made to hear. Limbs were made to be reached out. Legs were made to walk on and to jump on. The eyes were made to, to see and ears were made to hear and the tongue was made to talk and every healing he did told to the world the restorer has come. The restorer has stepped into the room. The restorer whose purpose and plan is to restore everything is brought to the very kingdom of God. Many years ago there was a miracle, I mean not a miracle they, they, and some might call it a miracle it was a miracle of silver screen I guess you could say. There was a movie that, that came out that shocked the Christian world. It shocked the civilian world. It was a movie made by Mel Gibson called The Passion of the Christ years ago. It was a message in which Mel Gibson tried to, to his best ability, to depict the pain, the suffering, and the sorrow that our Lord and our Savior endured and he went through. It was, it was, it, it was one that shocked the world because a lot of people already had a, a more sterile view of what, the, of what the cross was already. They had a, a little bit more tamer view of what the cross was. Let me tell you, I don't even think he scratched the surface of what our Lord and Savior actually endured for you and for me. And as I sat and watched that movie, there's a, there's a part of that movie that causes me to almost melt down every time. Ain't no, no, nobody here ever melted down. But I'm, I'm almost melting down every time I see this movie. At this one very scene where Jesus is stumbling through the streets under the burden and the weight of the cross. And as he's stumbling through the, through the streets as the, as the Romans whip his back and crack the whip against a back that is already opened oh, from the stripes that had been laid upon him, his mother Mary is trying to find a way to get to him. She's find, trying to find a way to, to talk to him. She's trying, trying to find a way to get a message through to him. And she runs down the side alleys looking for an opening in the crowds where she could reach her son. And she finally finds an alley and she goes running through that. And when she does... She runs through that crowd and here is Jesus stumbling under the weight of the cross as he gets near to, uh, near to her. And she runs up while the guards are distracted and she runs to his side and he looks up beneath the thorn, crown of thorns with blood covering his face with, face with bruises everywhere. As he looks up to her and she says, she, she cries out for him and he says something that stir, always stirs me to the core. He says, behold, I make all things new. Oh, and every time I want to just stand up and say, yes, Lord. But see, see, Calvary wasn't just about saving you. It wasn't just about washing your sins away. It was about restoring every scar that sin has placed upon this earth. It's about restoring everything that has been made wrong. Jesus come to make right. Jesus come to bring back to the proper order of things. He came to restore it back to the vision that he once had. He came to restore it back to the desire of the Father's heart. He came to restore all things and make all things new again. That was the mission of the king. Not just to come and die on a cross, but to come and start a process of restoration that would go throughout the ages. A process of restoration that you and I are a part of. A process of restoration that started with you. God, God found somebody that wasn't deserving of him, that wasn't deserving of his grace and his mercy and he saw what a mess you made of your life and he reached down and he pulled you up and he restored you back to what he intended for you to be. So you see, there's a call upon our lives, a call upon our lives that we would be a part of that restoration, that we would reflect the restorer in everything that we do. So that leads us this morning to our power principle. Today's power principle is a very simple one. It says to be born again is to live through Jesus. To be spirit filled is to let Jesus live through you. 
Let me say that again. To be born again is to live through Jesus. To be spirit filled is to let Jesus live through you. This miracle sounded a lot like Jesus, didn't it? It felt a lot like Jesus. It seemed to be a lot like Jesus. The atmosphere of Jesus was all over that temple that day. You say, well, well why does it feel like that when Jesus wasn't even present? Was it physically present? Well, let me tell you, he was. And this miracle that took place, the crowds begin to point to Peter and John and said, look what you've done. And they step back and they say, oh, you don't understand something. It wasn't us that did this. It was Jesus that did this. Jesus had worked through that man, those two men to accomplish the restoration that, was take, that had taken place that day. I want you to know, church, that is the call that Jesus has brought to our life. To be Jesus to our neighbors. To be Jesus to our city. To be Jesus in every situation and circumstance. It, we are called to a spirit-filled life where we allow Jesus to be Jesus in in us. Now let me tell you something I believe it's crucial for us to understand. What these two disciples did was not an act of reckless courage. It was not just an act of being, of being, of, of, of twisting God's arm and making him do what they wanted him to do. It was an act of simple obedience. They felt the Savior stirring inside them. They felt the Savior using them. They felt the Savior operating through them. And as they had become more and more prone, how did they become prone? They become prone through prayer. Notice with the very opening statement that, that, that Luke says here, where were they going when this event took place? They were going to the temple for the hour of prayer. It wasn't just that it was a set hour. No, it was an entire hour that these men would come together and pray to God. They didn't just have spontaneous prayer. They had scheduled prayer. And when you begin to pray more and more as a spirit-filled believer, you plug into the kingdom of God. You begin to feel his directing. You begin to feel his moving. You begin to know when he's speaking to you and when he's walking through you. And this, this, these two men experienced that in their life. They begin to reflect the restorer in everything that they do. Now how, Derek, how does Jesus work through us? Well, I believe this is a perfect picture of how Jesus worked through, through us in the life of, the, of, of what took place that day. The very first thing that we see here in the Word of God that, that Jesus worked through is that Jesus the Restorer sees through us. He sees through us. Jesus sees everything, amen? Jesus knows everything. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus uh, sees in ways that we don't see. But, and every once in a while, Jesus, I believe he'll just come, come up alongside. He said, I want you to see through my eyes for a little while. I want you to see the way I see. I want you to see what I see. I want to see how I see. I believe that Jesus saw through the eyes of those disciples that day. How do you know that, Derek? Because of what they saw. How do you know that, Derek? Because of how they saw. How do you know that, Derek? Because of the, of the looks that, that, that you, we see in verse number 4. Notice what it said in verse 4. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. Look at us. There was some looking going on. First of all, I want you to notice that they didn't look away. <laughs> I like that. They did not look away. How many of you have ever lived in the city, a big metropolitan area? Yes, you, you know that after a while you get in the habit of just looking the other way when there's a beggar. Looking the other way when there's somebody with their hand out. Looking the other way when there's somebody street, sitting on the street. It's a habit that we get into. It's a habit that we can condition ourselves for. And it was easy for these disciples to fall in that same habit. Beggars filled Jerusalem. Beggars filled the streets uh, that day. And it was at the hottest point of the day. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they were on their way to the hour of prayer. They were on their way for something that was important. They were on their way for something that they needed to do. And they were on their way to get basically in the shade. Out of the, out of the heat of the day as they walked by this man. But as they walked by that man, Jesus stopped them. As they walked by this man and he stuck out his hand and he said alms to them. Oh Jesus stopped them and they began to see him like Jesus saw him. You see Jesus isn't intimidated by our need. Jesus isn't isn't going to just look the other way. We have the full attention of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When you call out to him, 
You know one thing. He's not too busy. He's not on his way to do something else. He ha we have his attention. And when we allow Jesus to see through us, he'll give us the focus of the hurting that is around about us. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you feel stirred specifically towards someone, you feel stirred and, you're, and you can't, as these men can't take your eyes off of them. Maybe it's Jesus saying, I want to work through you. Maybe it's Jesus saying, I want to see through you. Maybe it's Jesus saying, I want to show you what I am seeing now. You see, not only did they not look away, but they saw it all. I like that. They saw it all. They saw what this man had endured. Forty years. Can you imagine? Forty years of being a cripple. Forty years of having to be carried from one place to another. Forty years of having to beg. They saw the years that had been lost, but they understood something. Jesus had come to restore not just his body, but to restore the years. As Joel, Joel said, he'll restore the years that the canker worm has eaten away. He'll restore the years. Oh, well, brother, you don't understand. For decades I didn't serve the Lord. For decades I lived the way I wanted to live. Give your life to Jesus, and he'll restore even the years that you've lost they also saw that he had lost his identity in the midst of it all he had stopped being a name you notice that he wasn't mentioned as a name he had stopped being a name and he started being a condition he started being the lame man he started being the beggar. He started, you see, sometimes when we find ourselves in a condition for so very long, we begin to identify more with the problem than we identify with who we really are in Jesus Christ. Identify more with what we've been through. Identify more with the scars than we do with the Savior and the healer. Identify more and more with those things. And so these men saw, here was a man who had lost his identity to the, to the suffering. He had lost his identity to the shame. He had lost his identity to everything that had marked him, scarred him. He was also identified in another way, which is awful. And that was that in the, that day, in that time, there was a theology that was prevalent. That theology was that if you were crippled or lame or blind or had any kind of deficiency in your life, it was a judgment of God before you. That you, either you sinned or your parents sinned. sinned. That was what the, the, the teachers of the day was teaching. So every time they looked at him, they didn't feel like he was deserving of any grace from God. They didn't do didn't believe that he was deserving of any help. They didn't believe that he was deserving of anything because in their theological mindset, he was a sinner. He had been marked as a sinner and they saw he had lost his identity. But I'm so glad for this next point. They saw that it was his time. Forty years he had sat in the more, one of the most popular uh, entry points to the temple of God. Forty years he had sat there. I believe the disciples had passed him thousands of times. I believe Jesus had passed him time and time and time again as he sat there uh, in this way. I believe, I believe you say, well, why, Derek, would that happen? Why, Derek, would that take place? In the why? Because I believe at the time it was not God's time for him. But it was, now was God's time. There was a stirring that took place in these men. And as they looked at him, they realized something. They realized that it was God's time because Jesus had stirred them. Jesus had begun to move among them. Him. Jesus had begun to say and what they turned to him and said is look at us they drew attention to themselves because they knew that Jesus was about to do something great through them they knew that Jesus was about to move upon their hearts and life Jesus will, wants to he desires to and he will see through you if you let him the second thing I want you to understand is that the, the Jesus the restorer declares through us you see, this wasn't just a scripture that they were declaring. They were declaring the very will of God over this man's heart and life. Notice what he said in verse number 6. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. 
they, Jesus, was declaring through them that very, that very moment. I, I, I really believe it. Some of the things I noticed about this declaration that I really liked is, first of all, it was a declaration of bankrupt dependency. First of all, they, the first thing that, that, that Peter said, and he declared to, for everyone to hear, is silver and gold have I none. Can anybody say that this morning? I am, I, I, I don't have anything else to give you. I don't have, like my, the resources that I give to you won't bless you. The resources that I can give to you won't help you. The resources that I can give to you won't turn your situation or your circumstances around. I don't have a whole lot in the bank account. I don't have a whole lot oh, in my family lineage. I don't have a whole lot in my own talents and my own abilities. But such as I have, I give to you. Let me tell you, I love that. You may be bankrupt this morning without a dime to your name but if you have Jesus on the inside if you have the Holy Spirit moving through you and operating through you you have more than the world could ever give you have more than the world could ever bestow you see this was a declaration not just of their bankruptcy but a declaration of the world in which they live if I had a million dollars it still wouldn't get you off that ground if I had a million dollars it still wouldn't wouldn't change your life if I had a million dollars it still wouldn't bring strength to your ankle but such as I have will. Such as I have will lift you up. Such as I have will bless your life. And it was also, I love this, it was a declaration of the name of Jesus. What did he have? He said what he had. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You know this is the first time that they used the name of Jesus in the book of Acts. The first time since the ascension of Jesus Christ that they used the name of Jesus in the declaration over someone. And it, and it was a declaration of who and what Jesus was. You see, in our times, we, we think of it as, as, kind of a, as kind of a magic word in the name of Jesus. But in Jewish times, you got to understand that to the Jew, your name represented not only who you were, but the authority of your household. The authority that you have and you possess. When you declared somebody's name... You were actually declaring those two things. There's an old Hebrew phrase, and I like it. It's, it reads like this. It says, himself is his name, and his name is himself. In other words, you, the, the, the name that we declare over somebody. If, it's somebody, if it's Derek's name, it's me. When you talk about Derek, you're talking about me. So why were they declaring over this man? Jesus. What were they declaring over this man? Who Jesus was. His authority, his power, his strength, his anointing, his enabling. Whenever we call on the name of Jesus, guess what? He backs it up because we're, we're talking about him. We're pointing others toward him. We're revealing to others who Jesus truly truly are in our life. You see, it's that, it's, that, it's that name that will transform us and change us and turn our lives around. It's the signet ring of the king, the name of Jesus. When the kings of old had a message to take, they would take that signet ring. They would drop hot wax on the message and they would, they would seal that message with the signet ring. That signet ring was only to be broken open by those that had the authority to break it. On, or broken o, o, open only by those that were to be the recipients of it. Jesus' signet ring was the name of Jesus Christ. When I call on him, I'm calling on heaven. When I call his name and declare his name, I'm declaring the kingdom of God. I'm declaring the kingdom of heaven. Here they were bringing the kingdom of God right back into their midst. God has called us to declare him to the world. God has called us to declare his authority to our situations. God has called us to declare his strength where we have no strength. He has called us for declaration. And then thirdly, Jesus the restorer lifts through us. I like that. He lifts through us. You see, believing Jesus was acting through Simon Peter, which I really do. I believe that, G that Simon Peter moved in unison with Jesus. And without even thinking, he reaches down and he grabs a hold of that hand oh, that had been reaching out uh, to, 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 for alms and he lifts that man to his feet. He lifts that man up from where he was. He lifts that man up from, from, uh, from, what he, from, from his condition. I don't believe that there's no evidence that anybody witnessed this miracle. No evidence that anybody else saw what was going on. 
They saw the after effects of it. They saw what had happened. But you see, they weren't doing it for everybody else. These men were lifting one man. This man was lifting this man from where he was. He was lifting this man from that place of com comfort to that place of conformity in his life. You see, sometimes in our lives, sometimes we need to realize that there needs to be a lifting anointment on us, anointing on us. There, there's sometimes we need to take, it takes more in our life than just prayer and faith. Sometimes it takes some heavy lifting. Sometimes it takes moving on the faith that we have. Sometimes it makes, takes acting out what, what God would have in our life. You see, sometimes it takes more than just those. That, well, you know, don't just tell somebody, I'll pray for you. Say, I'll pray with you. Say, say, say let me know how, how I can help. Let me know what I can do. You see, that's that lifting anointing that comes upon our lives. that calls us to reach out our hands and to lift that brother, to lift that sister in Jesus' name. You see, that lifting sometimes means lending our faith to, to another. Lending our faith to another. This is one of the rare miracles in the, in the Word of God. I want you to, but I want you to notice it is crucial to our theology because some people have theology that declares something totally different. And that is, this man had no faith. This man didn't know he needed any faith. This man didn't know that faith. And I hear her preachers all the time. If you don't have faith, you're not going to receive from God. This man did. I've, I've heard people say, if you, you got to have faith. You got to have faith. But no, this man was delivered. This man was healed. This man was lifted. Why? Because somebody else had faith and they lended their faith to him. Who was that man? A man by the name of Simon Peter that said, such as I have, I'll give unto you. He felt that faith rising up within him and he reached down and he lifted that man up and the power of God moved through that. I don't think the man even knew what was going on. All of a sudden strength come to his ankles. Strength came to his feet. Why? Because somebody loaned him some of their faith. You want to get my goat more than anything you start rebuking somebody for not having enough faith. I'm like who are you? The faith police? <laughs> if you have so much faith lend them some. Right? Right? If, if they don't have enough faith, then it's your time to reach your hand out. It's your time to say, I'll believe with you. It's, it's time to lift them to the level of your faith. It's time to lift them to the level of your belief. Sometimes it means lending your faith to another. I want you to know something. There's been many times in my life, many times as I walked with God, I just hit a low point and I just hit a place where I didn't have faith until some good brother came along and reached down and said, let me lift you to, to this level. Let me lift you up from from that faith that you don't have. Let me lift you up. And in that lifting anointing, Jesus can work in so many ways. And then, that also means touching others. I believe what shocked those people more than them lifting him was them touching him. He was a sinful man that was scarred he was a simple man whose feet was disformed and twisted. He was a simple man that probably didn't have a whole lot. He probably smelled. He probably, he probably hadn't bathed in for, forever. And they reached down and they lifted him. You notice something about Jesus? Jesus healed people in many ways. But his primary way of healing was touching. He touched the blinded eyes. He touched the leper. He touched the, why? Because I believe Jesus understood something. Sometimes there's a powerful power in simply touching. Sometimes there's a powerful power that can, can, can release his presence in the midst of a situation by simply touching. Brethren, sometimes it means coming to that brother that's going through a hard time and just putting your arm around him and say, I know what you're going through. I know what you're enduring. I'll, I'm praying for you. I love you. And let me tell you, you'll be surprised by the power that that'll bring to their life. Ladies, sometimes it'll mean reaching over for that sister's hand and taking her by the hand and say, oh, I, I've heard about the situation or the circumstance. Talk to me a while about it. Now, speak to me a while about it. Let me pray with you for a while about it. You see, there's a power in the touch of the anointed hand. There's a power of the touch of, 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 of being upon people's hand. We need to realize that and we need to touch people with permission, of course. Reaching out for those that are in need. There's a power in the touch. And then finally, 
And I would be remiss in skipping this point completely. Jesus the restorer heals through us. That's what this miracle is all about. This miracle was all about the healing and the restoring of someone else. The healing and the restoring of what God had in their life. You see, it makes sense to me if we understand that Jesus has come to reverse what sin has caused in people's lives. It makes sense to me that the two major effects that hit the planet when Adam and Eve bit that fruit of the tree was sickness and sin. Sickness and sin entered into into the equation then. And now everywhere Jesus went, he said, I'm going to reverse it. Everywhere Jesus ran, he said, uh-uh, it doesn't hold a bond in the kingdom of God. Everywhere Jesus went, he went touching and healing and transforming. It was the very nature of who Jesus was. It was the very nature of what Jesus was. Notice what it said in verse 7 about this healing. And verse 8, I'm sorry. And so leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. I think there's one more verse before that, Michelle. No, I'm sorry. You, you're right. You're right, as always. Oh, as always, you're right. <laughs> See, I, I just earned some brownie points right there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> sir. You see... This healing, I want, you to know, I want you to notice it was a threefold healing that took place to this man. It was a phenomenal healing that took place in this man. There was no doubt about it that this was healing. There was nobody that could question and say, well, this is all a trick. This is all a fancy. This, no, this was, this was a true healing that took place in their life. And as we begin to embrace that Jesus has called us to heal, we won't be afraid to lay hands on our friends. We won't be afraid to lay hands on our neighbors. We won't be afraid to lay hands on our children. Let me tell you one of the greatest things that you can do when your children comes to you and say I'm sick is not give them a bunch of NyQuil and put them to bed. One of the greatest things that you can do and, and yes the NyQuil will work too but just first of all say can I pray with you and when their little eyes look up they say yes you pray over them and they'll begin to see Jesus in mama. They'll begin to see Jesus in daddy. They'll begin to believe. And let me tell you if, if you ever wanted somebody to pray for you let a child pray for you. They'll pray and they, they expect a miracle to happen right then and there. They expect God to move right then and there. You see why because I believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he has done, he will do. He's the Savior. He's the healer. He's the Holy Ghost baptizer. He is our soon coming King. Church, I believe he's still that in our lives. And when he heals us, he heals in many fold ways. See, he healed his body. I like that. Anybody in the medical profession? Anybody? Colleen's kind of hiding her hand back there. She's like, kind of don't want to. There is a word called atrophy. That if you've, ever, if, if you've ever heard it, what it simply means is a muscle that hasn't been used over a period of time will cease to be able to be used from that time forward. If you took your right arm and you tied it to the side of your chest and you did not use it for a year's time, after that you would never be able to use it. That muscle would be incapable of movement. That muscle would be incapable of doing. This man had been there for 40 years. He was a major, major recipient of atrophy. His muscles were probably as hard as a rock. His muscles were petrified. There was nothing that could be done for him. I believe a creative miracle happened the very moment that Simon Peter said in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He made it clear that uh, for everyone to hear this is who's healing him. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and as he began to lift him I believe new muscles began to form in his ankles and his legs. I believe bones that were disconnected become connected. I believe deformities that had happened at birth all of a sudden become reversed and corrected. There was a miracle that took place in his body. Jesus was doing a miracle, an impossible miracle, because our God does not know the meaning of the word impossible. And there's another miracle that we often overlook here. This man had never learned to walk. A child is born with the capacity. At a certain age, there they have the ability to walk. But how many of you know? How many of you had a child that didn't want to walk? Just want to lay around. Want to lay around. I tell I tell people that has kids, don't teach them to walk. You teach them to walk, you'll be chasing them for every moment uh, from, from that point for the next few years. They have the uh, capacity and the ability to walk, but they have to learn to walk. Right? 
You've sat there and said, come on, baby, come on, come on. And they step out and they, they, and they usually face plant a couple of times before they really, really, really got it right. Let me tell you something. Jesus gave this man an instant lesson, not just in walking, but in leaping and in running and in dancing before the Lord. There was a miracle that happened, not just in his body, but in his mind. There was a miracle that happened in his life. I believe he was a man that couldn't believe what he was doing. That's why I believe he kept clinging on to Peter and John because he was like, I can't believe I'm up this high. I can't believe I, I've never done this before. But he couldn't help. His feet just couldn't stop moving. He couldn't stop leaping. He couldn't stop dancing. He couldn't stop praising the Lord. And he quite created quite a scene in the temple. When you've experienced that kind of miracle, don't tell somebody to sit down and be quiet. Because it'll unleash something in their life. Because Jesus is the healer of our bodies. Isaiah prophesied that there was coming a time when the Messiah would come. And there's a mark of the, of, the, of, the, of the Messiah being in our midst. The mark of the time of the Messiah is a simple one. That the lame would be leaping. <laughs> I don't remember seeing that in the Gospels. But it seems like that he wanted, to, he wanted this to be a, a, a demonstration in the book of Acts. That he was still working. That he was still moving. That it was still his time. When he caused the lame to be leaping in the temple. Because his sons, Peter and John, obeyed Jesus and followed him. There was also a healing of his identity. I love that. Now, the person that they ignored for 40 years, they couldn't ignore anymore. <laughs> the person that they thought had no name, he was just a piece of furniture that was sitting over there. All of a sudden, he was leaping and jumping and dancing and magnifying and praising God. Why? Because no longer could he be identified as lame. No longer could he be identified as a beggar. No longer could he be identified as even a sinner because all of a sudden his life has been transformed and his life has been changed in the midst of it all. His identity had been changed and transformed. And the way he was hanging on to Peter and John, I can't help but believe that when Peter came out of that Sanhedrin court, and we're going to see that in two weeks, when Peter, come out, Peter and John come out of the Sanhedrin court, that there stood that man. And he was introduced to his brand new family, the Church of Jesus Christ. And as they rejoiced, and the power of the Spirit fell on them, that he rejoiced, and the power of the Spirit fell on him, his entire eternal identity, I believe, was changed because he had met Jesus through Peter and John. And he was quick to believe, I believe it, with all my heart. He was quick to say yes to the salvation of Jesus Christ. He was quick to, to, to embrace him. Why? Because Jesus healed his identity through them. And also, this was a healing to his soul. Now, he was, for the first time, allowed entry into the temple. The significance of that, I think we miss in the modern day. Time. Because he was lame and crippled, he could not enter into the temple. But as soon as he began to walk and leap, he, I like what, what Peter did. Peter didn't say, oh, you need to stay out here until we clear things up. Uh -uh. Peter and John said, come on, come on, come on. Come on. And he, he's going into the temple. And those, those, old, those old religious people begin to look at him. Oh, look at the man in rags over there. He's dancing and praising. He's getting out of his mind uh, of, 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 of what's going on. And, 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 and they begin to, begin to scorn him. But they had no reason to reject him because Jesus had brought a healing to his soul. And the, the, how do you know that? Because the Bible says he was praising God. He was magnifying God. He was lost in the... He didn't care what anybody else was saying. He was just lost in the presence of God. He didn't care what anybody else was thinking. He was lost in the very presence of, of, of the Word of God. Reinhard Bonnke. Anybody hear of Reinhard Bonnke? One of the greatest evangelists in Africa. Died just a few, few years back. But he wrote a book. And the book is called Plundering Hell to Populate Heaven. I like that title. But he started as a missionary in this little small village in Africa where he was a pastor of a handful of people, just a, just a few people. 
And so he invited this, this super duper uh, evangelist from the states to come in that was known for praying for the sick and, and known for, for, his, uh, his, for his magnetism and, and the way. And he brought this man in and he said they had a wonderful service. And, that, and the next night, he said, he said, Reinhardt got up and said, okay, tomorrow night, go get all the sick people. Go to get as many sick people as you could possibly get and bring them into the, to this building. He said, we're going to have a healing service and I believe that God's going to heal. And he felt the Spirit of God on it. He said, the next day about lunchtime, he passed the evangelist with his suitcase. He said, where do you think you're going? He said, I got, a, I got another better appointment. I've got other things that I got, I got to do. And so he said, he left me left me there high and dry with all these people coming that night. And he said, I began to pray that afternoon, Lord, give me the words to say that I'm sorry for stirring them up. That I'm sorry for offering them this, uh, this, this opportunity. That I'm sorry for, for what, they're, what they're going to. But the evangelist is gone. There's nothing I can do. He said that night, that place was packed with the hurting. Packed with those that the doctors had long given, given up. And he said he stood there before them with the apology written out and the Holy Spirit moved on him and said, preach the word. And he began to preach about the healing virtues of Jesus Christ. Then, he, then the Holy Spirit said, pray for them. And as he called them to the front and began to pray, he said, I saw a miracle after miracle, after miracle, after miracle, after miracle. He said, before long, that house was cleaned up. People weren't sick anymore. People were healed by the very grace of Jesus Christ in that, in that midst. And what happened that day forever changed his ministry. He, began, he stopped pastoring just merely five, five people. He started, he started preaching the stadiums of people that were giving their hearts to Jesus Christ. Why? Because he stepped out and Jesus said, if you'll let me, I'll be me and you. If you let me, I'll touch through you. If you'll let me, I'll heal through you. If you let me, I'll lift through you. If you'll let me, I will be a deliverance and I'll declare my words through you. If you believe, all things are possible. Some people don't like that quote in the Bible where Jesus said, greater things than I have done, you will do. He wasn't saying that they're going to have all this power. He's saying that he's going to do greater things through them in, in, in Jesus' name. Jesus wants to touch through you. Jesus wants to heal through you. And what happens when that happens? The same thing that happens in Acts the third chapter. Joy breaks out. You want a sign of a church that is, that is on fire with, for Jesus Christ? And that is joy will break out. As joy begins to break out in our lives and break out in our hearts, all of a sudden, you don't have to constrain it. You don't have to, all of a sudden, when God begins to move and God begins to touch, when God begins to bless and God begins to, to transform, all of a sudden, you're going to find a happy group of people that you can't keep on quiet. A happy group of people that you can't keep them from leaping maybe sometimes. That you can't see, keep them from, from singing the praises of God sometimes. A happy people People that are transformed by the grace of God. This past week I read a quote and I loved uh, the quote by Vance Havner. Listen, listen, what he, listen what he said. He said, some dear th souls think themselves dignified when really they are petrified. We have lost our leap. But the world's so bad, Jesus is still good. But the world is going to hell as quickly as it can. But no, we're going to heaven. But everything's falling apart. But that never stopped God before and it's not going to stop him now. I believe God can move among his people like he has before. And he chooses to move during the very darkest days. He chooses to move during the very darkest of times. Jesus wants to be Jesus in us. Would you stand with us in this place this morning? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. One pastor said, and I, I agree wholeheartedly, he said, if we truly believe 10% of what we profess, we would be 100% more enthusiastic. 
<laughs> because it would change our lives and change our world. Jesus wants to be Jesus through you and through me. I want to pray this morning. I want to pray this morning. I don't want to take too much of your time this morning. But I want to pray that Jesus would move through us. That Jesus would give us opportunity after opportunity to be what he would have for us to be. But I would be remiss this morning having preached that Jesus is the healer. To not give him an opportunity to do that very thing. If you're in this house this morning, as me, immediately after we pray our prayer, I, I, I'm going to take some time. If you need to leave, if you need to go, your excuse. If you need to be prayed for for healing, maybe you need to give faith to somebody else for healing. Maybe you need to stand in, instead of somebody else for healing. Whatever that need may be, I'm going to I'm going to remain up here on stage. I'll shake your hand next Sunday. <laughs> I'll say I'll say goodbye next Sunday. But this morning, I would be remiss because I believe with all of my heart that Jesus still does miracles. I believe with all my heart that Jesus still brings healing to our bodies and life. So immediately after our prayer, you're either dismissed or, or please join me up here and we'll anoint you with oil as James tells us and we'll pray over you. I'm going to ask if, if, uh, if my board can help me. You're the elders of the church to pray over these that may be sick this morning. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit in this place. I feel him moving among us even now. I believe he can do the impossible. Even in our midst. Lord Jesus, we look to you, God. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you take us, Lord God. Our hands, our eyes. Lord Jesus, our strength, our ability. And Lord Jesus, that you move through us, Lord God. That you be Jesus in us. That our lives may reflect the restorer in this place. That our lives may reflect though that one Lord Jesus that is making all things new. That is bringing all things back to the way it's supposed to be Lord Jesus. That's bringing all things back to a, a, a state that is better than what it was before because it's restored, restored not according to what we've experienced but according to what you intended Lord God. We pray Lord Jesus that you would anoint us your servants. Touch our hands. Touch our feet. Touch our lives touch our tongues Lord God touch Lord Jesus us so that we might be what you'd have for us to be oh in Jesus name Lord God we pray right now Lord Jesus that you would move upon the hearts of those this morning that are in need of your touch God that are in need of your healing Lord God that are in need of your strength Lord God that you would touch them even now Lord God as they step out to give the Lord Jesus to give you an opportunity to move through their situation to give you a chance Lord God in faith Lord Jesus to trust on the healing virtue that is still in you our Lord and Savior in Jesus name we pray amen and amen God bless you we appreciate you this morning